الحمد لله الحمد لله يا رب العالمين يا رب لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وهو الذي في السماء رب وإله يعبد ويطاع وفي الأرض رب وإله يعبد ويطاع وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء الله ذو الفضل العظيم من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه أما بعد أيها المؤمنون There is an ayah in Surah Al-A'raf The number of the ayah is 157 <coughs> I will read the ayah and then I will zero in on the portion of the ayah that becomes the pivot of the khutbah. The ayah begins, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيَّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع This is the part of the ayah that I want you to listen to closely <coughs> ويضع عنهم إصرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم فالذين آمنوا به وعزروه ونصروه واتبعوا النور الذي أنزل معه أولئك هم المفلحون This ayat begin with is speaking to the condition in specifically to the condition of Bani Israel. Another way of explaining the history of Bani Israel is they are Muslims who went wrong. So we as Muslims can go wrong and therefore end up like Bani Israel. The ayah is saying, the part of the ayah that I want you to follow with me is, وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِصْرَهُمْ 
والأغلال التي كانت عليه. This the Prophet of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل the one that they find quoted mentioned in their Torah and in their Injil. He came to relieve them of the constrictions إصرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم. They had legal burdens and they were chained with regulations. Because in their history, they turned technical with Allah, Jalla Sha'nu. So he turned technical with them. They would not just accept a command or a demand or an order for Allah from Allah. If Musa told them to do something, then they'd ask, okay, tell us, explain to us more. So the more explanations they demanded, the more restrictions they received. Allah's last prophet came to relieve them of these burdens and these restrictions. <clears throat> and we have the Qur'an, the Prophet, Islam, Iman, we have this as a relief from the burdens that they were in. What are the burdens that they were in? What are we speaking about when we speak about these restrictions and these very demanding tasks? To explain to you how demanding these tasks are, these obligations are. One Jewish rabbi, an honorable person who observes his Jewish faith very conscientiously. Yours truly was sitting with him and the food was served. We were sitting next to each other and he said, explain to the hosts that I cannot eat of this food. And I asked him, I said, I can do that, but they're going to ask you, why can't you eat the food that we are serving? I understand that there are dietary regulations concerning the meat. But what about the bread and what about the fruits and vegetables and the other servings that are not meat? He said he still cannot eat those. And he explained why he cannot consume those edibles because they don't meet the strict dietary standards that he goes by. So we skip the details and I realize, of course, the interaction was going back and forth between the rabbi and some of his, uh, some persons who were of the Jewish faith who were accompanying him and the rest of the hosts and people around who were all Muslims. The history of Bani Israel has, and the, the, uh, another ayah in the Quran says, فَتُوبُوا إِلَىٰ بَارِئِكُمْ فَقُتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ and one of the explanations of this ayah is you have to kill yourself. Now, of course, there are different understandings of this. That's why I said there's one understanding of it that says 
In order for a person to make a tawbah acceptable by the Almighty, he has to kill himself. Another aspect of the legalistic burdens they have due to their peculiar pestering of their prophets if there was some type of najasa on a cloth or a garment the way to get rid of the najasa was to cut it out of that garment of that garb there's no such thing as washing away a najasa it shows you another restriction that they had another one if a person kills another person whether it is intentional or whether it was by mistake it was not intentional the person who did that who killed the other person has to be killed And we can quote other types of burdens and chains that they are living in when they are in this world. It is so demanding that one of the rabbis said the reason we do not proselytize our religion it is because we are confident that others cannot live according to these standards. That's how strict and that's how severe their lifestyle is. Now, this ayah in Surah Al-A'raf so that this final prophet from Allah came they, and this is another point Muslims don't really present neither to themselves nor to the other the point is the Prophet of Allah is specifically mentioned in the Torah and in the Injil. So this Prophet came to relieve them of this type of constricted, almost phobic lifestyle. And now we have our Islam, a relief from the heavy weights of legalism. When the Prophet sent two of his companions to Al Yemen, he said to them, Yassira wa la tu'assira, wa bashira wa la tunafira, wa tatawa'a. He says, present this relationship with Allah as being a relationship that is doable, not something is going to break someone's back. <clears throat> Try <clears throat> your best to entice people. To, to this Iman and Islam. And don't be repulsive. Don't have people run away from you. And be cooperative with each other. Don't be at odds with each other. Be like magnet and steel. Don't be like two magnets that repulse themselves from each other. Examples 
What do we have examples of this? The Prophet of Allah, I'm, I'm saying this brothers and sisters, you know usually I try not to go into these types of details, but I'm doing this because this has become a matter of discussions in different communities and societies. When it comes to a salah, our salah is not a burdensome salah. The Prophet says, "Man nam an salatin aw nasiha, fal yusallihha idha zakarha." Whoever sleeps and is not awake for a salah, even whoever forgets and cannot remember whether he prayed or she prayed or not, then when they wake up and if they remember, they perform the salah. There's no punishment for your human nature. At the time of fasting, the Prophet said, مَن نَسِيَ فَأَكَلَ وَشَرِبْ وَهُوَ صَائِمْ فَلْيُتِمَّ صِيَامًا Whoever during the time, during the day of Ramadan, whoever forgot to or absent-mindedly, what it means, whoever during the day of Ramadan when you're fasting, if you absent-mindedly drink something or eat something, you should continue your siyam. Because in the latter part of the hadith, the Prophet says, Allah wanted to feed you, or Allah wanted to offer you water. This is not the Israeli attitude. When, if something like that were to happen in the Israeli context, they would have to pay for that mistake. We don't consider it a mistake. During the Hajj, this is during the Prophet's time, during the Hajj, someone comes up to the Prophet and he says, Halaktu qabla an anhar. You know, it, when you go to Hajj or Umrah, you do certain things in a certain sequence. That's the way it's supposed to be done. But what if you do something before something else? In this case, this person is complaining that he shaved before he sacrificed the animal. And the Prophet responded to him, he says, Ifal wala haraj. Do it. There's no problem. When it came to any of the stations of the Hajj, if someone went to Mina before the time or after the appointed sequence of time, or Al Safa and Al Marwa, or Al Muzdalifa, or any except Arafat. Arafat has to be on the ninth of the Hijjah. Any other thing you can do before or after. And this occurred multiple times, meaning from multiple individuals, and the Prophet says, it's all right, you can do it, there's no problem. In the, in the, uh, if you're an Imam in the Salah, there's a hadith from the Prophet that says, I come to pray, I come to lead the prayer, and my intention is to read an extended amount of time, ayat after the Fatiha. But then if I hear there's a baby crying, then I will shorten my qira'ah because of my feeling for the mother and for the baby. Compare that with what we have nowadays. The Prophet also on one occasion, he advised one of his companions 
not to when you lead the prayer not to lead it with a an extended qira'ah now extended here is a matter of whatever society you're in whatever culture you're in whatever your tr- traditions you are in whatever the level of tolerance you are in but the bottom line is you take into consideration the other or the others and you don't say they are not muslims or they are crypto muslims or they are kafirs or you're not responsible towards them you that attitude did not exist the prophet of allah says rufi'a al-qalam 'an al-muslim fi hal al-khata' wa an-nisyan wa al-istikra you know we have a registrar everything we do is being registered but he said that instrument of registering everything ceases in three conditions one of them is al khata you made a mistake you made an honest mistake and when we speak about an honest mistake here it's not one of the kabair it's not a sin or a major sin so when this is if this is going to be written against you as you would expect it to as bani israil would expect it to it's not when this yan also if you forget allah is not going to take you f- to task for something you forgot and al istikra someone is compelling you to do something you're not responsible for that so you're not responsible during three occasions in life an innocent mistake when you forget and when you're compelled to do when you're forced to do something when we compare that to what we have today we have people who there's two extremes here people who are so fired up that their understanding of islam becomes fanatic and we have others i'm talking about muslims here we have others who are reactive they are so fed up with fanaticism that they want to go to the other extreme and become liberals these two attitudes you can detect them in your local communities and you can detect them as far as cultures and traditions are concerned populations have this problem you you either become a fanatic which is wrong or you become loose which is wrong and this problem has budgets it has governments behind it they see our condition they study us they know who cannot understand islam in a balanced way as it was meant to be ma ja'ala alaykum fi din min haraj taha ma anzalna alayka alquran litashqa other ayat other hadiths all of them indicate teach us not to become fanatics and not to become counter fanatics meaning reacting to those who are fanatics aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum ad'uhu subhanahu wa antum ala yaqin bil ijaba wa tubu ila Allah inna Allah tawwab rahim الحمد لله بجميع المحامد 
على جميع النعم وصلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters, taking into consideration what was just expressed in the context of Allah's ayat and in the context of His Prophet's teachings, taking all of that into consideration, we focus our attention on what is happening in the land of the Prophet in the birthplace of Islam? What is happening is something like a rapid change. Things are beginning to change there, unlike anything that has happened in previous years in that kingdom. You may say that they are suffering from an identity crisis. And this is the beginning of that identity crisis issue. We are just living at the beginning of it. The first thing they did during the course of the king's son now who is angling to become the king in these past two years, they clip the wings of their, what they call Hayat al Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar. Other translators here in the West refer to it as the moral police. What they did was they took away their authority. They told them, you can't arrest people just because you suspect that they are violating some moral standard. If you suspect anyone, you refer the issue to the police and the police will do their work. You have no business in people's lives. That was the first step. That was followed by permitting women to drive. That still hasn't gone into effect, but it will if things hold up until then. Around this coming Ramadan of next year, of the next solar year. And now in their in their social media, this we're talking about the land of Allah's Prophet. We're talking about the land of revelation. We're talking about the formative history of our Islamic foundations. What's happening now in their social media, and, and you know governments can go into social media and shut it down. They can shut WhatsApp down. They can shut whatever else they want down. If, they, if draconian measures have to be, have to be made, and if they want to be true to their fanaticism, they can withdraw cell phones from the kingdom. It's not like it's odd for them to do such drastic things. But they're permitting now what? They're permitting in their social media, and this right now is causing a stir among them, they're permitting pictures and videos of a man and a woman riding on a motorcycle in Saudi society. One behind the other on a bicycle or a motorcycle in Saudi society. This was unheard of before. Now also they are showing images on social media of young men parking their car in front of malls and then having young women 
go into the vehicles, whether they were vans or SUVs or whatever they were, going in there with their boyfriends. This was also unheard of. Now, take into consideration what was said in the first khutbah. There's the attitude of fanaticism, which exists. That's why they're going to have a very severe identity crisis. The issue of fanaticism on one side and the issue of liberalism on the other side. Because now the reaction to all of this in a society in which the average male grew up only familiar with the face of his mother and his sisters. That's all. He didn't see no other female face in his life. Now, all of a sudden, they're speaking about one thing leads to another. The liberal side addressing the fanatic past in the tense moment is saying a relationship, actually they said the word adultery, zina, a relationship between two in consenting individuals is the person's own freedom of choice. Why should anyone have anything to do with that? The, these are now the rumblings inside a disintegrating society because it never accepted to approach Allah and His Prophet with their open minds and their open hearts. They approached Allah and His Prophet with fanatic hearts and with closed minds. And this is what's happening to them. And then furthermore, they're saying we need to be watching these Turkish films. Turkish films are about romance, about the ups and downs in relationship between lovers, issues of family and divorce and cheating, one spouse cheating on the other. And now Saudi society, they're beginning whatever was pent up deep down inside of them, they are beginning now to express it in public. And it's all beginning there on their social media. These developments at their psychological level and at their community level are taking place within a larger political context. We mentioned to, to you a couple of weeks ago that a very important Saudi figure went to the Yehudi enclave in occupied Palestine. Well, the Yehudis themselves came out just in the past day and they said, in fact, that person was Muhammad ibn Sulaiman, uh, ibn Salman, the king's son. That was him. So the conjecture about who that personality was and law likelihood it was MBS, now that has been expressed in public in the in the media of the Hebrew press in the Hebrew press and in in some uh, some other parts of their media what was he doing there of course he's trying to bring relationships closer relationships between the ruling family in Arabia and the ruling tribe in Palestine he's trying to bring them together. Why? What do they have in common? Ask yourself, what's in common between the fanatics of Arabia and the terrorists in Palestine, the Israeli regime? What do they have in common? They have one thing in common. They know some, some go and pray in synagogues, others go and pray in masajid. Some call it, uh, one side calls itself Jewish, the other side calls itself Muslim. But what's bringing them together? 
What's bringing them together is their common hostility towards Islamic Iran. That's what's bringing them together, nothing else. There used to be a Saudi ambassador in Iraq. But a couple of years or so ago, that embassy was terminated and they, uh, the Saudis didn't have an ambassador there. But this guy becomes the troubleshooter for a new face of the Saudi regime. His full name is Tamir as Sabhan. He shows up this week. He shows up in the Syrian city of Raqqa with an American, a high-ranking American intelligence, I guess it's military intelligence person. Both of them show up in Raqqa. Raqqa is the only significant urban center left in Syria in which these Daishis and ISIS types and Qaeda and all of the subcontracted operatives of the Saudis and imperialism and Zionism. What's what what are we to understand from this? He wants the release of 50 Saudis who were fighting with these terrorists. He wants the release of 50 of them. At least we have some type of information now. And he's not new. He's not, he's not the only one. There are others coming from France and Britain and other places and even the U.S. They want the release because Raqqa now is the gray area in which these operatives of imperialism and Zionism and Saudi flunkyism, they are there with what is called the Syrian Democratic Forces. This is the new wave of the coming future. The radicals and terrorists could not deliver. Now, they are putting together another force that is supported by the Saudis, a previous Syrian opposition figure by the name of Ahmed al-Jarba is in charge now of that force. And now they want to try to detangle their past from their future. The failing policies of the past have to be arrested and they, they are trying to begin a new movement forward and all of this is why are they doing all of this? Why do we have all of these officials and military personnel going secretly and in front of cameras both ways they're going to Raqqa because there's going to be a final showdown in that area. The Syrian government now has retaken control of almost 90% of the areas that they, uh, or let's say 90% of all of Syria. There are only about 10% left. So those policymakers in Riyadh, in Tel Aviv, and in Washington, among other places, they feel like their bet right now is on, instead of the sectarianism, which didn't work, they wanted Shi'is and Sunnis to kill each other, didn't work, even though there has been many miseries and many sad and tragic events that occurred in this past, but that grand scheme of igniting 
an all-out Islamic civil war that will consume the Muslims for the coming generations, that did not work. This also means that the Saudis are trying to send signals to Turkey and to Iran that now we are supportive of a new democratic force in Syria and we are supportive of ethnic and national breakaway tendencies. Now, I could easily interject what I'm saying right now with ayat from the Qur'an and with hadiths from the Prophet indicating that we should be acting as one body of people. What we are referring to here is our policies and strategies that mean to defeat the ayah وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا The hadith, الْمُؤْمِنُ أَخُوا الْمُؤْمِنُ and other many ayat and many hadiths. So don't think we are here on some type of political tangent. We're going off and just analyzing politics. No. We are saying what we are saying in the context of understanding Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So the Syrian democratic forces and the Kurds now have become the new Trojan horse of imperialism and Zionism and their subcontractors in the Arabian Peninsula. The other development in all of this is they're trying to, they meaning these officials, civilian and military, who are going to Raqqa are trying now to stir the latent feelings of Sunnis there. They still haven't given up 100%, but if they could on the basis of, because over there there's a sense of tribalism, if they could bring some of these tribes together using ethnicism and sectarianism, why not? Also, the Saudi regime is signaling its endorsement of Trump. He is now virtually reneging on previous U.S. policies and agreements. The JCPOA, you know, he's, uh, he's been speaking about that. Iran being the supporter of Islamic, uh, being the supporter of terrorism in the region and in the world. And the Saudis want to give the impression that they also want to rebuild a new Syria. What they're trying to say is the forces that we support, we are going to give them money and we want their areas to be prosperous compared to other areas in that general region. What should be mentioned also for your information is they've created, and created here it doesn't have a shara'i meaning of course, the Saudis created a special security and intelligence apparatus only for Muhammad ibn Salman. He has his own intelligence service that is, doesn't report to anyone else. And they overrule all other departments and functions of security and intelligence in that kingdom. Knowing all of this, being aware of all of this, how do you think they are watching representatives of Hamas who arrived in Islamic Iran? Hamas, its leaders have realized that they were fooled by 
the regime in Egypt, even though right now they're trying to work through that, and they were fooled by Saudi Arabia. How many times are Muslims who are in positions of responsibility and policy making and strategic thinking, how many times are they going to be fooled? They keep on falling into the same trap and they don't learn from their own mistakes and they can't learn from their own history. When is the time arriving when we will have mature, experienced, insightful, and struggling Muslims who can deal with reality given what they have. Reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understanding His Prophet. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'ah. Wa arina al-baatila baatilan warzuqna ajtinaba. Wa la taj'alhu multabisan alayna. وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك وإنه لا يذل من وليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح